Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we will be doing the novel Incandescence by Greg Egan which was published in 2008. Before we get into it please subscribe if you haven't, give us a like, drop us a comment and now Incandescence. Before we begin we gotta set the stage so you can understand the universe that this story takes place in. In this universe in the Milky Way galaxy there are two civilizations the Amalgam and the Aloof. The Amalgam is an entity that controls all of the stars in all of the spiral arms of the Milky Way galaxy. They do not control the stars in the bulge of the Milky Way galaxy. That is the stars in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The territory stops at about 13,000 light years from the central black hole in the galaxy in a ring that completely goes around the bulge. The bulge and all of the stars in there, including the central black hole, is controlled by an entity that the amalgam call the aloof. No one has ever seen a member of the aloof. Anytime someone sends something into the bulge, whether it be a drone or a ship, whatever, it is sent back out. It is not harmed in any way or destroyed in any way. It is just sent straight back out. And no one has ever been able to communicate with anyone or anything in the bulge. And it has been that way for over a million years. Now all of the residents of the amalgam can trace their DNA to 11 panspermian events. So there were 11 worlds that were in the middle of the galactic disk between 20 and 30,000 light years from the galactic center that are responsible for all of the life forms that exist within the amalgam. The residents of the amalgam are virtually immortal and they only die when they decide that they have lived long enough and have experienced and done everything that they have wished to do. Next thing is that there is no faster than light travel in the amalgam. Everything is bound by the speed of light, but they can travel at the speed of light. They also don't use ships all that often. They more tend to use a transmission system similar to the Star Trek transporter in that from whatever planet they are on, they can convert themselves to energy and then transmit it to their destination or to a node across the light years. They can exist in these nodes as software for as long as they want, existing in these nodes in virtual environments of their desire. And when their bodies are reformed, they are not limited to being reformed back in their original bodies. They can be reformed as any of the member species that inhabit the amalgam. They call when they are reformed being embodied. As I said earlier, when they are being transmitted from one point to another and it's not in a straight line, they would stop off at a node. Now these nodes are not very big, they're not like space stations, they're actually just a few cubic meters of processors that are floating in interstellar space. Now one other thing is that there are citizens of the amalgam that were born in the nodes as software and when they wish to be embodied in case they ever go down to a planet, they tend to pick whatever body is the dominant life force of the planet they're going to. Most of the amalgam citizens who are born on a planet, they usually stick with the body that they were born in. Again, as I said before, there is no FTL travel in this universe. They are limited by the speed of light and they are transmitted at the speed of light. So while the traveler experiences no time at all passing between when they leave one node to the other, on the outside they know that thousands of years or hundreds of years will be passing depending on their destination. Now because of the aloof territory that takes up the center of the galaxy, when one is traveling in the amalgam territory from one side of the galaxy to the other, they have to go around the bulge and that can take thousands of years, 60,000 years, depending on how far around they want to go. But about 300,000 years before this story, a married couple from the amalgam had detected signals leaking from the aloof territory and were able to hook up 
the amalgam network to it and send themselves across the bulge to the other side. Now the aloof have not stopped them from doing that, so brave amalgam citizens would take that chance, although most of them do not. And that route is called a shortcut. One other thing is that the amalgam citizens have the technology needed so that they can download a specific skill set into their brains and they can be embodied with that skill set. And one final thing is that the amalgam citizens have the technology needed to create a backup of themselves. So if they're going to someplace dangerous, they can create a backup and if they are accidentally killed or inadvertently killed, they can rebuild themselves from that backup. And now let's get on with the story. A stranger came up to them while they were sitting there and asked Rakesh if he is a child of DNA. Rakesh was a bit annoyed because everything he would want a stranger to know about him was included in his priestess. His priestess is a summary that's broadcast so that anyone who he meets would know who he was and where he came from. The stranger's priestess included details about its ancestry and its sensory nodalities. Rakesh decided to give the stranger the name Lal. Lal was invited to join them, which she did. She replies that she overheard their conversation, that everything has been done and everything has been discovered. And she goes on to say that she can offer him a cure for his malaise. She goes on to tell them that DNA panspermia has been extensively studied and every world its reach was thought to have been identified long ago. But there is evidence that a new world that has DNA is waiting to be discovered. She's hoping to find someone who's willing to go and look for it instead of her. She doesn't have the time or the inclination. Rakesh, who's been sitting in this node for 96 years and has been waiting for something to grab his attention, decided he just might take her up on it. Lal goes on to tell them that she is in a synchronization clan whose members travel the galaxy alone but they agree to meet up at prearranged locations every hundred thousand years. She goes on to say that she was on the wrong side of the galaxy and would miss her meet up if she just took the amalgam network. So she decided to pass through the aloof network. And while in the aloof network, they embodied her and they showed her a meteor that appeared to be a fragment of a planetary crust that was ejected by an impact event, and inside it was filled with DNA. She never met the aloof. Everything was automated. She woke up in an interstellar habitat that was designed for her, and, and she figured since that shortcut was going to save her 5,000 years, the least she could do was to find out what they wanted. Her examination of the DNA in the meteorite seems that it was a mature divergent branch of panspermia, and that it must have originated on a world of its own. She was shown a map where they found it and that when she examined it, the ambient radiation levels have means that it has been exposed for at least 50 million years. It also means that the planetary system it came from must be inside aloof territory. After discussing it for a while, Rakesh decided that he would go and she handed him a glass key that contained all of the data. So she made him promise that he would see it through, succeed or fail. She then bid him farewell and left. C and Via tried to talk him out of it, but he had given his word, so he was going to go. And Parantham decided to go with him. Ho'i had been tending crops on the eastern hot edge of Splinter for several shifts and it was important work because you had to kill the mites and the weeds and ensure that there was enough food to feed everyone. And now she was trying to find a place that she could rest and get out of the wind. As she headed down the tunnel, she came across a group of males that was clinging to a rock, begging to be relieved of their ripeness. Each of them had separated the two hard plates that ran along the side of their bodies to expose a long soft cavity where there were five or six swollen globes. These were seed packets, and she used her mating claw 
to reach into the male's bodies and snip the globes free and deposit them inside of herself. She stripped all of the packets from the first three males. They were grateful and quickly disappeared into the crowd. And she took two globes from the fourth male and then found she was full and she whispered some consoling words to him and left him begging for relief. It turns out that the males found having those globes very unpleasant and the unplugged globes would eventually shrivel up and die but waiting for that to happen could be a painful ordeal. And while there were tools that they could use to do it, a female's mating claw made it much easier and more effective. She left the crowded chamber and headed down a more quiet area where she could find a crevice that she could rest in. She soon ran in to a single male standing by himself. He wasn't begging for help. She went to go around him, but then he began speaking to her, and he introduced himself as Zack. She introduced herself and told him where she worked, and he told her that that's valuable work, and she asked him, what do you do? He told her he doubted that she'd heard of his task and that he's been working alone. She didn't ask him why he remained unrecruited because he was quite old and probably in poor health, and she wasn't going to try to recruit him in his shape. So as they're walking along, he goes on to tell her that he spends a lot of time in the calm near the null line, and she asks him doing what, and he said playing with some contraptions and trying to figure out something simple. When she asked him what is it he's looking for, he said he's not sure, but he'll recognize it when he sees it. He then asked her, do you ever wonder why we climb up the null line from the hot and cold quarters, but down to it from the north and south. She answered him saying, what is there to ponder? That's the way it is. He goes on to tell her that if you ascend to any other point and then continue in the same direction, pretty soon what was originally above you is now below you. If you go straight through the null line, that doesn't happen. If you go from hot to cold, the null line remains above you. If you go from north to south, it remains below you. So he goes on to discuss his observations about the null line and the areas around it and getting her to think about it. To question why things are the way they are. To reach a junction in the tunnel, he said before they part, maybe he could show her something. And he opened up his carapace and pulled out a rolled up sheet of cured skin on which there was a map of the splinter. At first she wasn't impressed until he told her that it was a map of weights, not a map of tunnels. At first she didn't see a need for such a map because as she said, everybody knows that the weight increases as you move away from the null line. So why do you need such a map? So he asked her, in what manner does it increase? How quickly and in what way is down when you move between quarters? So he goes on to tell her that the map shows you how much weight increases as you move away from the null line and how fast. By the time he had finished speaking with her, he had gotten her to agree to take some measurements in her spare time as she was traveling around the edge to confirm if the weights on the map was accurate. At which point, there was a story she remembered that she told him about how someone told her that at one point the weights were so strong that it tore the world to pieces and that's where their name for their world came from, the splinter. At this point he opened up his carapace and pulled out a device made from a long tube that she would use in measurements and showed her how to use it. He then parted, promising to meet up in 36 shifts and she went and found an empty crevice and went in and went to sleep. C organized the departure for Rakesh and Parantham. He designed a scape that would allow them to leave in style. In this scape, they were on a ship that was about 50 meters long, and they were in the middle of green seas as far as the eye could see. He gave them a little goodbye speech, and then two heavy metal chains was taken. One was put around Rakesh's body, the other one was put around Paranthum's body. Then Rakesh and Paranthum climbed over the railing and jumped into the water. This had been the third node that Rakesh had visited since he left his home world. When he was on his home world, he had promised that he would leave after a thousand years, and that's what he did. 
and the first two nodes he figured were too close to his home world. So when he got to this third node, he had stayed there. At the bottom of the ocean, he found a pile of bones. And as he sucked in some water, a key appeared in his mouth. And as he dug through the bones at the bottom, there was a metal vault. And the key opened the metal vault's door, and Rakesh went through into a space full of stars. Roy waited until she was confident that her loyalty to her work team could survive a few missed ships before she headed back to the null line and Zack. She had planned for the journey to take 12 ships, four ships traveling to the null line, five visiting with Zack, and three on a return leg. Zack had given her a series of maps that would show the way to the rendezvous point that he had chosen near the null line. Along the way, she wondered if she would be ambushed and recruited by Zack and the team he had hidden. Along the way, she passed a group of children that were playing with their tutors, mimicking everything they did. A little later, she passed a chamber where the Susk and the Murchi were grazing with their herders. She was also wondering if the splinter was once part of a larger world, and if that was true, how had the mother world itself come to be? When she got hungry, she stopped and began munching on a patch of kahu. And as she ate, two herders approached her. She was a bit suspicious of them because she was alone. And if they tried to recruit her as a new teammate, she was outnumbered and surrounded and had nowhere to run. They asked her what she did. And she told them that she tended crops at the edge. And they told her that's valuable work. And she complimented them that so was theirs. And they asked her where she was headed to the calm and they told her that's a long journey. She told him that she needed to spend a few ships seeing the world, that it will make her a better worker. And as it was leaving, one of them said, work is what makes better workers. And she responded, perhaps. And he responded in disapproval, but headed off. She next came across a series of chambers where teams work to turn susk carcasses into products. She next ran into some couriers and spoke with a pair of them. The talk began with her asking them if they had seen a new team or teams conducting new work in the calm. And that began a discussion between her and them, with her trying to convince them that there are times when new work is possible, that the work they've been doing could not have been the same work all the time, and they telling her that the world has always been this way and always will. Later she found an empty crevice where she went to sleep. The next morning when she woke up, she began thinking that she doesn't understand the wind. In the hot side, it blew in from the incandescence that was in the east. It went through the porous rock of the splinter before escaping on the opposite edge and in the cold side, the flow was reversed. Between the opposite winds was the calm. She believed that the pattern of the wind was related to the pattern of the weights, but she didn't know where that connection lay. The null line lay in the middle of the calm, but the calm extended far beyond it, encompassing a whole plain that stretched out from the south to the north, as well as the east to the west. She also realized that there was a pattern to the light. The next thing she came across was a team that was working to pull metal from a vein. And she wasn't sure, neither was anyone else, how the veins replenished themselves, whether it was by some slow process or some other means. And she thought that there must have been a time when there was nobody extracting the metal because it didn't grow like weed. And there must have been a limit to how long the metal could have lain untouched in the rock before someone realized how to make use of it, whether that was thousands of generations or a million. But the era in which people had failed to use the metal could not stretch back forever. And to her, that meant that there was a time when there was no people. She took some measurements and then used the maps that Zach had given her to determine that she was ahead of schedule. As she went on, she realized she had to grip the floor with her claws a little better because she was getting lighter and people and plants were getting more sparse. She got to the rendezvous point ahead of Zach and began looking around. In one chamber she saw a fine vein of metal with other veins of metal anchored into it. 
that seemed to make a fine web that crisscrossed the chamber. And that's when Zach showed up. He told her that they had a thousand things to discuss, that he discovered something interesting, but there may be a problem as well. He told her that he thinks he can explain the weights on the map, and he thinks he's made sense of the pattern. He goes on to tell her that he thinks the map is wrong. He can explain the weights on the map, but he doesn't think the map matches up with reality. It took 12,000 years for Rakesh and Parantham to reach their destination planet, the planet of Massa. Rakesh woke up in his tent. It was the same tent he's had with him since he left his home planet, the planet of Shabinor. He knew he was embodied because of the way his muscles and joints felt. He went outside and looked at the stars and their magnitude and amount of stars in the sky staggered him. He was close to the center of the galaxy and very close to the aloof territory. Since Parantham was nowhere in sight, he called out to her, and when she responded with her location, she was in a small town called Faravani, which was 15 kilometers away. So he decided to walk there, since he was in no hurry. And so he closed his eyes and pictured his location on a map of the area and set off. Walking in a corporeal form was different from walking through the scapes of a node. He got there at sunrise. He didn't see any native life since Massa didn't have any native life. The locals had all come from a world that belonged to the P2 panspermia. The quadrupeds and communicated with sounds that was within his range. So he chose to communicate and speak their language himself. When he met Parantham, he saw that she had embodied herself as one of the locals. She said to him, flesh is flesh. The shape makes no difference to me. She had been born in a scape, descended from software that had been authored instead of translated from any kind of organic intelligence. So she treated bodies the way Rakesh treated vehicles. The main reason they stopped at Massa was to ensure and find out if anything had happened between the Aloof and the Amalgam while they were in transit. She told him that she told everyone in sight that she was headed into the bulge, but all they wanted to speak about was Layla and Jasim, who were the two that found a way to travel through the bulge, which is a loof territory. The two of them decided that they would hang around on this planet for a while before they headed into the bulge. Parantham went running with three locals, and when she came back, she introduced them to Rakesh. Their names were Sida, Fifth, and Padba. They have been friends since childhood, have traveled the planet together, but have never left it. Rakesh and Parantham told them why they're headed into the bulge, and they all discussed the reasons for it. That's when the two of them told them that they had their own mysteries that they're working on, and that was proving a mathematical theorem. And the three of them have been working on it off and on for 1,300 years. Later, when noon came, they all went out to eat, where they continued their discussion until night fell and the stars came out. Then Rakesh and Parantham prepared themselves to go and visit the Aloof in the Bulge. We will stop here and continue this in a future video. I'd like to thank you for watching and listening. Subscribe if you haven't. Give us a like, drop us a comment, and I will see you in the next video.